people like a bit of stop frame, but there's not much of it about. I mean, the skills base is very tiny. You know, there aren't many of us who do this. The people who do what I do, there's probably five. <laughs> You don't sign up for a Wes Anderson movie thinking you're going to make anything other than a Wes Anderson movie. I mean, that is how it is. He's trusting me to deliver what, what he wants, so I have to totally get inside that mindset and, and deliver that, even if in another environment with another director that would be a completely different process. So in fact, what he's really after is to achieve as much as possible in camera. So things that we're very much used to solving by using visual effects, post-production, we're now going back to where we were perhaps 30 years ago and creating those effects on set in front of the camera. So all those organic things that are very difficult to do in animation, such as rain and smoke and fire and fog and that anything that has organic movement to it is very difficult to make as an animated element because that very organic quality is very difficult to reproduce. So you have to find ways of doing that and they very deliberately have a, a handmade feel to them. So it, it's, it's kind of resurrecting old techniques. So, you know, typically we're making fog out of cotton wool and we're making water out of cling film and it's just finding ways to get those materials to behave in a realistic fashion. We typically shoot on any of these productions for the thick end of two years, and we would be shooting with anything up to 50 units. So we've got 50 cameras running, 50 sets simultaneously. As in all movies, there are 24 frames per second at normal running rate. So the animator goes onto the set, with their puppet and they pose up the first frame and they take a frame and then they move it and they take another frame. It's how you manipulate that timing. You know, if the puppet is pausing, then you can afford to take more than one frame at once. In terms of how long it takes, you know, have you got one puppet standing there blinking or have you got 70 chickens waving their arms in the air screaming, something like we had on Chicken Run, for instance. You know, that obviously takes weeks compared with a blinking puppet that might take a couple of hours. So what's going on is also the question, really. I've got top-down view of, of 50 units. I, I'm physically lighting, you know, with my gaffer and my sparks, I'm physically lighting maybe 15 of those units. I can't conceivably light 50. There's just isn't enough hours in the day. So I have another two or three guys who are lighting to my brief. But I see every frame that comes off every unit and I see every lighting test because I need to make sure that that movie looks like one hand made it. My hand. In terms of shooting stop frame, you know, there are challenges which you are not presented with in the live action world. Most of my best fixes for Wes revolve around uh, depth of field, which there's never enough of. <laughs> so, you know, everything is... You know, he's, his live action movies are all shot on super wide lenses with humans at sensible distances. And that's what he wants his animation films to look like. And it's often tricky <laughs> to get to that point. The main issue is the size of what you're shooting. So everything you're shooting is very, very close to the camera. So if you're doing a close up, instead of your actor being six feet from the camera, you'll your puppet, your actor, is, could be six inches from the camera. And this compromises what you can do hugely with your lenses because you're working right down at the minimum focus end or even into the macro end of a lens. And that makes a huge difference to the depth of field or the depth of focus that you have available to you. When I've got a puppet right up to the minimum point of the lens, if I'm at f16 or f22, I might just about have full focus from nose to ear. And everything else is mush. So if you want more depth of field, that becomes a challenge. Then you have to find ways of making your lenses work slightly differently or making the way you shoot different so that you can achieve that, that depth of look that you would expect 
if that puppet was six feet high. I mean, there are ways and means, and you know, we we have, you know, in extremis, we've we've shot the puppet foreground on green, and then taken the puppet away and rephotographed the background, and then put the, put the two together. Um, we do occasionally use the lens much further back, so the, the shot is actually smaller than you'd expect, which gives you better depth of field because the puppet is further from the lens, and then we can punch in on that digitally because we do have the resolution on the chip in order to do that. We were using the Canon 1DX. We went through a fairly rigorous testing process at the beginning of the job, which is something that we find ourselves having to do at the beginning of every job now, because since we have segued from shooting on 35mm to shooting on digital stills cameras, what we've got is a sort of upward curve of quality and development in the stills camera world to choose from. We tested six cameras very rigorously. Um, and that's not just about how the camera performs normally, it's how the camera performs over time. Because we keep the live view switched on almost constantly, because that is the image that the animator works to. So we're quite often forcing the camera to stay, forcing the camera to stay open so the live view is on constant feed. And that can have a very deleterious effect on the chip. The 1DX was a significant improvement and we had very, very little problem with the chip. It was super stable under temperature variation and it didn't suffer from being forced into live view all the time. And that was the reason we picked that camera because it's super solid, which is so important for us. It saves us hours and hours of time. And the other reason we went with it is because it interfaces very well with our software, Dragonframe, which is the sort of now the industry standard image grabbing software that we use in animation. And you can literally plug and play the 1DX into that without having to fiddle about with it too much. So all these things just make our life a bit simpler. How did I get started in stop motion? Uh, entirely by accident, actually. Uh, I had been out of film school for a couple of years and I was shooting some pop promos. And I knew some people at Ardman and I rang them to borrow some lights. And Ardman at that point was literally three men and a dog. There's three men, a woman and a dog. And they were intensely laid back, you know, and they went, oh, uh, are you doing anything next week? And I went, no, it sort of went along, this is 25. And there I was shooting a 35 millimeter commercial. When you start your career, you're absolutely desperate to do stuff. And within three years, I was shooting the wrong trousers and then it just sort of took off from there. I actually approached the producer on Fantastic Mr. Fox um, before I really knew Wes at all. In fact, I didn't really know about Wes. I was sort of strangely ignorant of his works at that point. Um, but I had heard that they were setting up a stop frame production in London. And so I went to see the producer and showed him my reel. And I think she showed my reel to Wes and I consequently got to the job. It took a bit longer than that, but you know, I got the job. My relationship with Wes is now entirely trust-based, I would say. He trusts me to do what he wants to do, and that's very important for both of us. Uh, and he will, you know, I'm, I'm his backstop in terms of visuals, I think. The way you photograph something, the way you frame something, and the way you light something should be as beautiful as you can make it. So it's not big flat light, go home. It's, it's proper photography, you know, it's proper cinematography. So we, we make as few concessions as we can to the limitations of our space and depth of field.